and the first one from Decro66, he says, uh, can you talk about quantum security and how it be implemented into ADA? And there's a second question, are there any exchanges participating? So let's stick with the first question there. Can you talk about quantum security and how it be implemented into ADA? That's definitely a Charles question. <laughs> So quantum computers are kind of these scary things that everybody looks at. They go, oh, God, quantum computers, as soon as they come out, everything comes to an end. It's going to kill my dog and burn my house down. And, you know, it's going to be road, road warrior and, you know, Mad Max. And, uh, you know, the doof warrior will be playing with a flaming guitar. This is, this is the, the canonical view when we hear the dangers of quantum computing. You know, the, the reality is that uh, these things creep up in matters of decades, not in matters of weeks or months. Uh, and we can kind of see the state of that entire industry from what IBM, Google, Microsoft, and other prominent quantum computing groups are doing. In fact, the best conference I, I personally attend is crypto for these things. It's usually in Santa Barbara, which I think it's always been there. And the guy who's in charge of Google's quantum computing group is a professor at UCSB. So he did, tends to do a presentation at crypto and say, this is the latest and greatest of quantum computers and what we can do and what we can't do. So the general consensus right now within uh, the cryptographic community and within the computing world is that quantum computers probably will exist and that they probably will at some point within the next 10 or 20 years get powerful enough to become a threat to traditional crypto like RSA and elliptic curve and, and these types of things because of the way these computers work. So what does that mean? It means today there is a big effort from NIST to start standardizing post-quantum crypto. So we're starting to ask questions like, what can a quantum adversary do? And based upon those attacks, what type of crypto will I need to bring into the space? So for example, you need better signature schemes. So there's hash-based crypto, lattice-based crypto, these types of things. And basically the long and the short is they're just changing the hardness assumptions, the mathematical properties and, and going to slightly different math and somehow, some way, we have a, a kind of a community consensus that this approach probably will give us a degree of resilience and resistance to a quantum computer. Now, that's just for the public-private key pairs, so the stuff behind how you spend your money. Okay. The problem is that a lot of these high-level crypto things that we do, like, for example, zero-knowledge crypto or MPC, they do have buried within the assumptions things that would be broken if quantum computers existed. So those more sophisticated primitives only work right now with the old legacy crypto. So while we can harden things like checkpoints and, uh, and securing your money, uh, we may lose privacy or we may have some trouble with the way we do the consensus protocol or random number generation if a quantum computer existed. So this is an open question and it is something that requires more research. So what we've done at IOHK is kind of look at this in terms of a three-stage process. The first stage process is just to get history somewhat locked down in a way that would make it really difficult for a quantum computer to unwind things. So that's the idea of a quantum resistant checkpoint that we do ever so often. Uh, so we hired Peter Schwabe, he's an expert in this field and we're writing a paper with him. And basically he's designing a checkpoint mechanism that we can put in maybe at the end of every epoch. And then that would then allow us to have kind of a sub ledger that would give us some certainty that uh, you know, if a quantum computer existed, they wouldn't be able to just unwind history instantly. The second approach is to start taking a step back and have a deeper discussion about what is a quantum adversary? What capabilities does this adversary actually have? And how does this impact every component of the system? So how does it impact the consensus algorithm? How does it impact your money? How does it impact how we use hashes? Well, whatever it may be, what will that adversary be able to do? And then we have to kind of say, well, okay, if we wanted to harden or make ourselves resistant from that, what are the trade-offs? The problem with this new fangled crypto is it's, uh, first, it's a lot more sophisticated. So there's a lot of areas where it potentially could have weaknesses, like there's uh, uh, Entru is an example of a signature scheme, and it has all these problems with it. Uh, so it, it, because it's more sophisticated, there's more opportunity for it to have flaws. And the second, it tends to be a lot less efficient like 10, 20, 100 times larger signature sizes, a lot longer time to compute. And when you're dealing with an environment like a blockchain where resources are quite scarce, it's a bitter pill to swallow to say that we should move the entire system to be you know, immune to some magic quantum adversary uh, if it means that everything's 100 times slower and you have a blockchain that's 100 times larger and potentially we lose features, like we can no longer do zero knowledge proofs or something with this type of a system. So we have to model the adversary and then we have to understand where we'd like to be. And then the third pillar is to take 
the old stuff that we used to do and find ways to keep doing it, but then do it with some semblance of efficiency uh, that we've we've come to know and enjoy uh, with elliptic curve crypto and so forth. Very complicated, and it's not going to be solved by anybody, any any cryptocurrency that claims to have this, uh, unless Dan Bonet is building it with the Stanford Crypto Group, and they, they have like five papers we haven't read. Uh, I would be very skeptical. But at the very least, in terms of uh, the particular checkpointing, uh, that's not super sophisticated, and it's actually a, a really good step forward. Uh, and uh, that paper was supposed to be done uh, last quarter, but uh, Peter has been kind of adding some extra stuff to it. So throughout the summer, that paper should be, and we'll kind of wind it in either towards the end of Shelley or sometime during the Gokin phase as a, as a nice closing protocol. Now, another thing is that this is actually closely related to how we handle shard management with um, Ouroboros Hydra. So the way we designed Ouroboros is that, you know, epics kind of have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's an election, and you populate them. But it is conceivable that you can run epics in parallel, but then you need some sort of coordinator to actually decide which shards your, which epics your transactions are going to go into, and also to allow cross shard communication, cross shard transactions. Well, the easiest way of doing that would be taking horizontal, vertically some sort of committee from those shards and then using a BFT protocol or something like that. Well, if we did that, it would also be conceivable to have those close the epics and then build a checkpoint there. So it'd be very logical during the Basho era, uh, once Hydra is done, to put in the quantum checkpointing scheme. But we may add it a little bit, a bit earlier because of uh, side chains or faster bootstrapping or, or something like that. So it's it's definitely here. It's not a super high priority because nobody has a working quantum computer uh, at the moment that can really break any of these things. And, uh, you know, we're still in a position where we we can preserve history through other means, uh, you know, like just by hashing it or something like that. So it's a fascinating topic and it's uh, younger people than me are studying it and will get Nobel prizes and Turing awards when they come up with major results. Uh, but it's kind of for the next generation, not quite for where we're at right now. 